when the hammer comes, it makes the spark that ignites the gunpowder that shoots the projectile out the rifle. Okay? They had to have 500 rifle flints with them as well to make sure the rifles fired. The third example of equipment they took on the expedition were 30 steel pieces. What would they need steel pieces for? What? Start fires. Start fires, you know, get the old spark going to start a fire. Okay, 30 steel pieces. Okay, on your ID sheet is this really weird word that's kind of hard to pronounce. But the fourth example is they took 1,100 doses of emetic with them. Emetic. And it is on your ID sheet. Emetic. They took 1,100 doses of emetic. Anybody know what that is? It helps with digestion. So they didn't have Tums and Pepsid AC and Pepto Bismol and all that. So if you got a stomach ache or you became sick to your stomach, what was the best thing to do? Well, what would, that, what, that, what would it make you do? Throw up. Throw up is right. It was a substance that promoted vomiting. Because if they got sick to their stomach, they didn't have a Rolaid or a Pepsid AC or, you know, Pepto-Bismol. They took this emetic and it induced vomiting that cleared their system and hopefully made them feel better. Yeah, it was made up That's right. Now, the fifth thing they took on the same note was 35 doses of a diaphoretic, 35 doses, excuse me, 3,500 doses of a diaphoretic, 3,500 doses of a diaphoretic. Anybody know what that does? What's a diaphoretic do? Any potential nurses in here? What's it make you do? Now, if you have the flu, what do you want to do to break your flu? Oh, sweat. You want to sweat, so it made you sweat. Okay, it, was a, it was a diaphoretic that induced sweating during an illness. So if these guys got sick, other than stomach issues, they gave them the diaphoretic and it made them sweat and sweat the poison out of their system. That was the idea. 3,500 doses yeah. <laughs> of a diaphoretic. Um, now, I always watch some of these kids. Paris Keynes is famous for this. She always comes into my office and goes to my water thing and gets what? Water. Hot water for what? Noodles. That's right, cup of noodles. Well, here's your cup of noodles on the Lewis and Clark expedition. They took 193 pounds of boiled down soup or dry soup. Basically, ramen noodles or cup of soup or whatever, same type of thing where you add water. They took 193 pounds. Now a hay bale weighs about 50 pounds, so it'd be, take, it'd be like taking four hay bales of dried soup to add water only. So they were, must have been the inventors of cup of noodles, right? So they took 193 pounds of boiled down or dry soup. Now how much does a bar of soap weigh about this big, do you think? I mean, three or four or five ounces? Yeah, they took 12 pounds of soap. 12 pounds of soap. Stay clean. 12 pounds of soap. The eighth example is they took 288 knives. 288 knives. That's what they, that's what they requisitioned and took with them. 288 knives. I don't know why that number would be. This might surprise you, especially you boys. They took 4,600 sewing needles. 4,600 sewing needles. Forty-six hundred, four thousand six hundred sewing needles. And the tenth example of equipment that they took on the expedition that was well thought out and organized, they took 130 rolls of tobacco. Most of those weren't for them, they were for the trading with the Indians because they didn't know what they were going to get themselves involved in, friendly or non-friendly. So they took 130 <laughs> rolls of tobacco, some of that to be used as gifts to the Indians that they might encounter. Now, Lewis and Clark believed in stern discipline. And it would be used along the journey. And I'm going to give you three examples of how they had to discipline men early in the journey. 
early in the journey. First of all, the first discipline came before they ever left. They had to discipline men before they ever left because these men visited a grog store. What's a grog store? G-R-O-G. -G. It's a hard liquor. And it was specifically rum. So what they did is they went to this rum store before they were going to leave. And do you think he allowed alcohol on this thing? No, because no, I mean they, they couldn't afford that. So he had to confine these men to their quarters before they ever left to make sure they didn't get out and get all rummed up and bring rum on the trip. Okay. So the first example of discipline is several men were confined to quarters before the expedition even started for visiting a grog or rum store. <clears throat> Once the expedition left, which we'll talk about in a minute, one man received a hundred lashes with a whip and sent back down river because of discipline problems. And he never finished the trip, never even hardly got off the trip. Did something he shouldn't have done and they gave him a hundred lashes with a whip and sent him back down river. And they actually had two men that were court-martialed for mutiny and desertion early in the expedition, John Newman and Moses Reed. Newman and Reed were court-martialed for mutiny and desertion. You know what the punishment was back in the way old days for mutiny? Death. Okay. What, what would happen to you if you deserted during these times and it continued through, clear out through the Civil War? What'd they do to you if you deserted or showed cowardice? What'd they do to you? They would brand you either with a C on the cheek for coward or a D on your chest for deserter that you would have the rest of your life. So anytime you went anywhere, you were obviously pointed out as a deserter or a coward. Howard was actually worse than a dessert, but some people got them both. So they sent John Newman and Moses Reed back after they court-martialed them for mutiny and desertion. Now, do I know if they branded them or not for sure? I don't, but I assume probably something like that happened. <laughs> so with all that said, kiddos, at 4 p.m. on May 14, 1804, at 4 p.m. on May 18th, Excuse me, May 14, 1804, the Corps of Discovery departed from Camp Dubois on the mouth of the Missouri River near present-day St. Louis, Missouri. However, it is spelled exactly like the Dubois you're aware of. So, at 4 p.m. on May 14, 1804, the Corps of Discovery departed from Camp Dubois, D-U-B-O-I-S, on the mouth of the Missouri River near present-day St. Louis, Missouri. Now kids, when I say the mouth of a river, that means that that river, the Missouri, does what? Runs into Mississippi. So it's the end of the river. The mouth of the river is where it flows and it ends and goes into another river. So if I say the mouth of the Yellowstone River, that's where the Yellowstone River runs into the Missouri River. If I say the mouth of the Missouri River, that's where the river runs into the Mississippi. Now keep in mind, kiddos, when they left at 4 p.m. on May 14, 1804 from Camp Dubois on the mouth of the Missouri River near present-day St. Louis, they were traveling upstream. They didn't get in the boat and travel down. The Continental Divide, everything east of the Continental Divide flows this way. Everything west of the Continental Divide flows this way. So they're not getting on these boats and floating downriver this way. They are floating upriver and paddling. So this was not easy. It will take them much longer to get to the Pacific than it will for them to get back for that reason. So keep that in mind. Everything's upriver at this time. Well, they leave on May 14, 1804, and they traveled for approximately three months. And on August 20th of 1804, they had their first fatality. What's a fatality? Death. Death. And what happens after traveling for approximately three months, Sergeant Charles Floyd Jr. dies on the expedition on August 20th, 1804. So after traveling for approximately three months, Sergeant Charles Floyd Jr. dies on the expedition on August 20th, 1804. Now, 
His death was later reported as a burst appendix. Okay? Anybody know anything about burst appendix? What it does is it fills your body full of poison. Basically not being gross, but your bowel kind of opens up and all that goes into your stomach and it will kill you, especially in those days when you can't rush you to the local hospital. So Floyd dies of a burst appendix. Here's the thing that's kind of interesting about it. The only death on the Lewis and Clark expedition happened three months in. No one else. There was not another fatality the entire journey, which is pretty amazing when you think about what they're going to be doing. Here, okay? So he was the only fatality on the expedition. Well, not too long after Floyd's death, the expedition runs into some serious trouble. What do you think that serious trouble might be, Julie Warren? Well, close. Hostile Indians. Okay? So they run into some serious trouble. What happens is the Corps of Discovery encounters the Teton Sioux Indians, who have basically claimed that part of the Missouri River as their territory. Okay? And they aren't interested in a group of white settlers probably coming through their territory. So the Corps of Discovery encountered the Teton Sioux Indians who controlled a specific sector of the Missouri River that the expedition was traveling. And basically you have kind of a face-to-face -face standoff. And this is kind of an interesting story because they are probably just as afraid of the expedition as the expedition might be of them because they have never encountered a group of 45 men and all this equipment, whatever. They've seen fur trappers here and there, but they've never, they don't know what to think about these guys. They're armed. they got 54 caliber rifles and gunpowder <clears throat> knives and everything else. And so it's kind of a standoff. And basically, if one or the other group would have made kind of a rash move, it would have resulted in probably the Corps of Discovery never existing. Might have been wiped out at that point because they were very outnumbered. Well, cooler heads prevail. And Sioux Chief Black Buffalo waves his braves off and allows the expedition to continue on their journey. So that was a tense time. And again, the wrong move by the wrong person could have resulted in disaster for this Corps of, Disco uh, Corps of Discovery. Well, the expedition continues, and they travel approximately 1,600 miles, and on October 24th, of 1801, they settle in for the winter at the Mandan villages. Yep, 1804. So the expedition travels approximately 1,600 miles, and on October 24th of 1804, they settle for the winter at the Mandan villages. Now, the Mandan villages where they settled on October 24th of 1804 really consisted of five different villages. They weren't really all lumped together. There were five Indian villages, and they estimated approximately 4,000 Indians lived in the Mandan villages, which consisted of five separate villages. And anybody want to know where that's located? Near present day? Yeah. Thus the name. What? Oh my God, girl, they're traveling this way. Oh. So where are they at? At the Mandan villages. My present day, Mandan, North Dakota. Okay? Present day, Mandan, North Dakota. Now, the expedition's going to spend about five months at these villages, waiting for winter to cease. Their plan is to move out in April. Okay, when everything kind of melts off and they can travel. So they're going to stay at the Mandan villages for five months and they're going to encounter bone chilling cold with temperatures that dropped as low as 45 degrees below zero. It was one of the worst winters that area had ever had. So very bright for them to stop there because continuing that expedition would have resulted in disaster. So they wintered in, hunkered down at the Mandan villages near present day Mandan, North Dakota on October 24th, 1804, and stayed there approximately five months. Now, during this winter, they made preparations to continue on when the snow cleared, and they needed a guide to guide them from that point on, because they didn't know where they were going. No. They hired a French-Canadian fur trader as their guide. Shh. 
guy by the name of Toussaint Charbonneau. So during the winter, the Lewis and Clark expedition needed a guide. They hired a French-Canadian fur trader by the name of Toussaint Charbonneau. We're going to get to you. Toussaint Charbonneau, it's on your list. Now, they not only needed a guide, they needed an interpreter because they knew they were going to run into some Native American tribes and they certainly did not know how to speak Native American. Well, it's kind of an interesting story because Toussaint Charbonneau just happened to have two Shoshone wives at the time. Both that could serve as interpreters along the, the uh, route. Well, Lewis and Clark didn't want him to bring two women with him, frankly. So they told Charbonneau, pick one of your wives to serve as the interpreter on the trip. And he chose Sacagawea, who at the time was just 16 years old and pregnant. So Charbonneau had two Shoshone wives at the time. So Lewis and Clark told him to pick one to serve as an interpreter for the expedition. The other would stay back at the Mandan villages and wait for his return. He chose of the two Sacagawea, who at the time was 16 years of age and pregnant, which I got a lot of clues on that, but that, that time that wasn't unusual. Really. Now, prior to their departure in April, on February 11th of 1805, Sacagawea gave birth to a son. So prior to their departure, on February 11th, 1805, Sacagawea gave birth to a son. He was given the Christian name Jean Baptiste. Jean Baptiste. So again, prior to their departure, on February 11th, 1805, Sacagawea gave birth to a son who was given the Christian name of Jean Baptiste. Now, as Lewis and Clark prepared for their departure in April, the Mandan tribal leader, a guy by the name of Black Calf, provided three very important items for the expedition as they would leave in April. Okay, he provided them with three very important items for the expedition as they would leave in April. First of all, Black Calf and the Mandan Indians sold the expedition food to take with them. They obviously had used a considerable amount of food during their 1600 mile trek. So the Indians sold the expedition food. The second thing that Mandan tribal leader Black Calf provided was he allowed the expedition to hunt buffalo with them, which was kind of unusual. They wouldn't normally do that. So any buffalo that were shot by members of the Lewis and Clark expedition, they allowed them to take with them for meat during their travels. So the second thing, the Indians allowed the expedition to hunt buffalo with them. Now, what would be the third thing that Black Calf did of great importance to them, taking into consideration they really don't know where they're going? No, he get not maps, but verbal communication on which way to go to get to the Missouri River. Because when they get into, just before you get into Montana and North Dakota, they're going to have to make a decision. Do they take the southern route, which in essence was the Yellowstone? They know they need to continue on the Missouri. But when they get to that point, they may get confused, and they gave them information on what route it was to stay on the Missouri River. Okay, so when they get to this fork in the rivers, which we'll talk about in a minute, they'll know which way to go. So Black Calf and the Mandans gave them advice on their travels to make sure they got up the Missouri River. Well, it's getting time to leave. But before they leave, Lewis takes their keel boat that they had gotten to the Mandan villages, and he sends it back to St. Louis with 12 men and the following items. And they're not going to return. They're going to bring this information and these items back to who? Jefferson. Jefferson. So just before they leave in April, Lewis sends their keelboat along with 12 of his men, 12 of the 45, back to St. Louis with the following items. Number one, dispatches. What are dispatches? These are going to go straight to President Jefferson. What are dispatches? Notes. 
information, letters, telling probably how they're doing, what they've done, where they're at, blah, 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 blah. It's going to be the last communication they're going to have with President Jefferson from this point on. So Lewis thought it was important to send dispatches back to President Jefferson to give him an idea. Second thing they sent were some live specimens back, like magpies and prairie dogs, which they had never seen before. So he sent back live specimens of things like magpies and prairie dogs. Magpies, you know what a magpie is? They're really noisy here. They got them around here. They're white and black birds. And they're, just, they're very annoying. The third thing he sent back for Jefferson to look over were bones of animals, plants, and furs of animals. Bones of animals, plants, and furs of animals to kind of let them know what kind of things they had been running into. So, in conclusion for today, where I get this stuff down, the Corps of Discovery leaves the Mandan villages on April 7, 1805. They leave the Mandan villages on April 7, 1805. And where are they heading for? The mouth of the Yellowstone River. So they can take the correct fork to what they hope is the Pacific Ocean. They know there's going to be a fork in the river, and now they know which way to go. So they're going to go for the mouth of the Yellowstone River. Now, as they take off on April 7, 1805, Lewis and Clark have one major concern on their mind. And what that concern is, is where in the world are these rumored, incredibly steep, rocky mountains? They know they're